Hey everybody, this is Matthew Krause, and you are listening to the podcast Working Drummer. Today is my interview with Travis McNabb. For a little over 13 years, Travis was the drummer with the rock band Better Than Ezra. In mid-2007, he joined the band Sugarland and worked with the duo for many years, up until their recent hiatus. He's continued to work with both of the artists, including Christian Bush, and most recently he did some session work with Jennifer Nettles, and you can hear Travis's playing on her most recent single. Currently, Travis is out touring with an up-and-coming country artist, Frankie Ballard. So in this interview, I'm splitting it up into two parts. I've done this once before, and I've decided to do it again. Uh, the interview went a bit long, but Travis has shared some really great stories that I think are really important to just split that up and make sure that I can share everything that we talked about. Uh, it was great. Both parts are great, and uh, I encourage you to check them both out. As always, you can go to workingdrummer.net. You can find us on Twitter at working underscore drummer. We're on Instagram. You can find us on Facebook. You can leave a comment, questions. You can subscribe to the podcast on iTunes, where a new episode will be sent to your smart device every week. So like I said last week, we're doing this in two parts. So let's get to it. Here is Travis McNabb, part two. And so I was playing with Billy Pilgrim, which was Christian Bush. And, right. Uh, but also then I wound up in this band called Vigilantes of Love. And we wound up signing a deal with Capricorn Records. Um, and same kind of deal as Seven Simons, like van in a trailer, touring... Around the whole country, uh, we have a record deal. We have records out, but, you know, we're barely surviving. Mm -hmm. uh, and in, in fact, uh, Dave Labriere, a lot of people know as Dela, who has played bass with uh, John Mayer for a long time oh, and cool. now plays on tons of sessions here in town. Mm -hmm. He and I were in that band together and yeah. rode around in a van together for <laughs> for a handful of years, yeah. you know. And so that was a uh, – and we're both – we did we knew each other from Athens, but we're both from New Orleans. And so mm -hmm. uh, he and I and the guitar player in that band all – we would occasionally do little shows in local bars aside from our band playing our shows we did we'd we the three of us would go play instrumental like basically playing meters songs and or our are also made up versions of meters stuff oh, okay. just and that was yeah. just a great education in like just like it was all about making stuff feel good. Like it wasn't worried about doesn't there's no changes, it's just a riff, you know, and there's no mm -hmm. melody, there's no singer. It's just like trying to make it groove and feel right and awesome. cop what Zigaboo does, you know, like oh, that, that gosh, you know, yeah. and so uh which, you know, I mean, for me it's uh, the, the the top guys are Zigaboo, Ringo and Bonham, you know. It's mm -hmm. like Ringo, creative ideas, playing for the song, and it has swing and feels good and has attitude. Bonham, just everybody knows Bonham's badass. And then Zigaboo for, uh, from the Meters, if anyone's not familiar, just a New Orleans funk band, right. uh, for like just super funky, you know, yeah. and and uh, and and the tone, kind of like Bonham, like it just sounds like drums in a room, you know. I mean, there's different phases of the Meters, and some of it's like the super seventies, you know. Uh, wallet on the snare dry stuff but a lot of the earlier stuff that's like early 70s late 60s it really just sounds like two microphones around a ratty drum kit and it sounds, sounds great like, you know so awesome so awesome yeah yeah, that's yeah. So awesome. yep i heard a story about johnny vadakovich uh -huh, uh -huh. that would play for hours i used to work with a piano player from new orleans okay. and uh, he would go in and watch him play for like two or three hours mm-hmm mm -hmm. By himself. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And he went to me and goes, Johnny, what are you thinking when you're playing? He goes, man, I'm not thinking about nothing. I'm just watching little lights bounce around the room. That's Yeah, that's right, like, man. What? Yeah, yeah. What yeah. kind of voodoo is this guy? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. No, the more you think when you're playing, the more screwed you are. You know, like, <laughs> like, like, like work on stuff. That's going to be your quote. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's, uh, <laughs> it's true, though. I mean, like, you know, uh, you know, it's been said many times over, but like, learn what you're supposed to learn and work on it when it's practice time. But when you're really playing, when you're, whether it's recording or on a stage or just it's a room full of guys, but you're all playing music together, you're no longer just working on your own internal mechanics and all that you got to quit thinking as much as you can you know it's really just about like being inside the song or the music you know and just l yeah. like reacting to what you're hearing without thinking about how to react just uh, hopefully you're everything you've 
taught yourself and and your experience and all that combines to allow you to be interactive with what else is happening in the room. I have a, a, a I hate to talk about myself on these things. I, I have an acoustic show tonight. This is mm-hmm. re- re- relating to what you're saying, and mm-hmm. we're doing a song we've never done before. Mm-hmm. I just had the mm-hmm. guitar and vocal track and say, "Hey guys, we're going to do this song tonight." So yeah. there's going to be it's going to be full band, but it's at the Bluebird, and it's uh, mm-hmm. got this little 16 inch kick drum mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. one cymbal and a, yeah know, yeah, yeah which which thank you for it being that i'm so not a fan of the box they said they said <laughs> are, are you gonna bring the that that, that box thing? I, like, yeah, I sold that <laughs> i sold that i don't now. own one and and oh, i try God. to avoid i try to avoid I, I being in guys situations really where do it well but I, yeah I, I that's true do, that's I true can't. there are some guys that, that do it really well yeah. I, I i give i blame myself for it not working well, because I can't do it. I, yeah, but part of it is just the nature of the instrument versus what it's being used for. The guys usually that do it well are using it in a setting that maybe it was created for. I you heard know? Alex Acuna do it exactly. for the first time. And right. It was, awesome. it was badass, right? Yeah. But we're approximating drum kit parts on it. We're trying to have a kick and a snare on it, and it's only going to work so well. It sounds like somebody beating on a box. It just does. <laughs> right. Well, it, it, and but, but but when we play that song tonight, I, I've been racking my brain on on how to feel if I should put a brush in my hand, mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. you know, do the Keltner thing or, mm-hmm. or what, and I yeah. just cannot figure it out. Uh-huh. And I'm gonna have to do that. I'm gonna have to just let them start, right? And then and then look around, kind of find the it right in the moment, brush, the mm-hmm. right thing. Mm-hmm. And just let it happen. And there's a little bit of gamble to that. Like, maybe it'll blow up and not be right. But, you know, but I, chances are you're going to find the right thing. Even if, now this is a different version of the song. It's a different setting. It's acoustic. So even if it doesn't feel like that song always feels, as long as it feels cool, yeah. and as long as you're all aware that this is a different interpretation at this moment because it's not what we always do with the big loud, whatever. Well, and this is the first time we're going to play it. But, ah, but the other thing see, is, is okay. we are going to be doing lots of full band songs with... You know, I mean, to- total rocked out songs mm-hmm. acoustically. And, you know, it's interesting. Uh, it's not always discussed, but I find that some guys, some guys want it to be just the same thing. But some guys subconsciously play stuff differently when they play acoustic. And so I think it's okay to lean into that a little bit, you know. Right. Um, you know, it's it's just, it's a different setting. So let the song work in a different way. Yeah, and yeah. as long as it's still musical, as long as the song still works, I think it's all right. And I think that the drums... I'm a little biased here, but I think yeah. the drums will steer the ship. Yeah, in no, a that's probably true. Like that. that is probably true. So yeah, yeah, a yeah. heavy tune, and I pull out the shaker and something like mm-hmm. that. The bass player like, hmm. all of a sudden he's reinterpreting. You know, like yeah. in the moment he's reinterpreting because he's hearing what you're yeah. bringing. You know, and so it's it's gonna yeah. force everyone to think that's a little true. differently. That's yeah. true. Yeah, I love these digressions, but we yeah, are, yeah. we are digressing. Yeah, yeah, we are. We are. Um, uh, if you aren't going to a particular place, you mentioned Keltner, and there's something that sure. that I would love to talk a little bit about just because it was a great learning experience for me um, that I feel like could be valuable to share in this, yes, this form. Um, well, there are kind of two things, actually, it's stories to tell with Keltner. One relates to the earlier thing I talked about with Arnoff, where um, – and even – in that moment where Arnoff was the guy who came in and played with the act I'd been playing with, I had been that guy before already. I had already replaced somebody who had been playing with someone. So mm-hmm. I knew that end of it. Mm-hmm. And so I think that informed me a little bit about he's not a bad guy. He's just been hired to come do this. Mm-hmm. And as I said, I'd read his story in Modern Drummer, and so I knew he had been through this himself. And so, mm-hmm. you know, so that led to that being, uh, you know, cool. And so one of the things I – in observing and being there while he was working, he came in and he is – in my mind, you know, Rich Redman is a is a great example of somebody who has a lot in common with Kenny as far as oh, yeah. to some degree in his playing, but also just in who he is as a guy, yes, his yes. personality, right? Um, and I don't know this, but I would venture to guess that Rich has modeled some of what he does or how he approaches things after Kenny because mm-hmm. Kenny's great. And mm-hmm. But the other thing to know is that after now knowing Rich for a handful of years, that is just who he is, you oh, know, yeah. like it's oh, yeah. not a put on. It's not a he's got he's directing it at certain things trying to accomplish certain things with it but you know he's just doing what is built into him and that's what i saw with kenny when he came in it was it was a big energy it was exciting it was he wanted to just come in and kill it and get everybody fired up and uh and and but it was a very positive up energy you know and i remember witnessing that session and thinking gosh if that's 
what it is because he was the first like super a level like guy I got to witness doing in the studio record mm-hmm. doing what he does was right, famous right. for, and uh, and it was he was awesome. He was sweet to me. He did a great job on the record. But I remember thinking, gosh, if that's just not how I roll, like just as a dude, like I don't have that super like, hey, you know, yeah. and uh, is that a bad thing? Right. right? Yeah. Like oh, I'm yeah. thinking, is that part of why he is where he is? I don't know. You yeah. know, and then <clears throat> six or eight months later, I was very fortunate. Um, a guy named Michael Bean, <coughs> uh, who Mr. had a Bean? Uh, not oh. Mr. Okay, B. So, okay, <laughs> no, uh, this was there was a band in the '80s and early '90s uh, called The Call. Yeah. Uh, yeah, he was the singer, songwriter, bass player, leader of that band. Okay, cool. And later, I wound up <clears throat> being in a band. Um, actually, he he hired me to play on a record that then I joined the band of that that record was for, and and so and at that point moved to San Francisco. This was a band called The Beggars. We were on Island Records, um, and. Uh, um, in fact, two of those guys went on to uh, become Black Rebel Motorcycle Club, if you've ever heard of that band. They're kind of a uh, s- sort of indie rock, um, just a cool, cool band. Anyway, we were in that this band together before that called The Beggars. Um, but Michael produced that record. But then as I've moved to San Francisco and I'm in this band, Michael's making his own solo record now that the call has broken up. Mm-hmm. And he hires Keltner to play on it, but he also allows me to play on a few tracks, which mm-hmm. was really cool. And he was sort of a – he was the closest – he was really the sort of musical mentor I had. Mm-hmm. Like there was a period of time where he really taught me a lot. Mm-hmm. And um, uh, so um, – so we're in the studio, and, and again, I've been uh, since I'm playing on some of the stuff. I've been welcome to hang out, and I'm 24 or whatever I am, while Keltner is going to do his tracks. Uh, yeah, and and so kind of two stories, but for the first one I'll relate to what I just was talking about with Arnoff. Um, Keltner came in, and total different vibe than yeah. Arnoff. Yeah, super like just chill. Uh-huh. Kind of Zen master, like put everyone <laughs> at ease, you know. But still, the thing they had in common, along with great playing and great ideas, obviously the musical part is a given mm-hmm. at this point, you know. Mm-hmm. Basically, once you get to a certain level, you better be bringing it musically. Like that's all – that becomes the given. So many other things are what kind of help propel you through a career and so much of it is how you interact with people. Um, but anyway, so Keltner comes in. Totally different energy than Arnoff, but the thing in common is super positive energy. Just Mm -hmm. like good vibe, everyone loves him, brings a good feel into the studio. And so in witnessing that, I thought, okay, I've got more in common with this guy. I I see this working. He's played on everything. He's giant, you know, he's Mm -hmm. he's legendary. Mm -hmm. And he's it's not the Arnoff super energy, it's just positive energy. He's just like be creating a good vibe. I love that. Yeah. yeah. And I so, love that. go ahead. Sorry. Well, just know that seeing both of those in a relatively short period of time, seeing how that worked mm-hmm. and the things they had in common, but that but the they were each just being who they are, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I realized, okay, then I'm yeah. uh, this, I, I understand now and I, yeah. I can relate and I feel like I. That's that was a big teaching moment for me as far as right. I don't have to try and put on a personality that's not yeah. me. You know, you just gotta you just gotta bring your best musical thing you can bring that's as right. a, as ideas and as a yeah. player, yeah. and just 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 get along with people and right. just be like someone people want to hang out with or you know like just be positive. You know, well, it's really important to I think to highlight. The fact that when you meet Rich Redman, you're like, who is this guy? This is crazy. Uh And then as you get to know him, you realize that he's the real deal. Yeah, yeah, that's right. That's right. And then uh, there's a lot of people that look up to him that that see his – the way he's made a career of this Mm -hmm. as as a guide. Mm -hmm. And so it's it's sometimes intimidating to think, well, I know – is, is such a great player, mm-hmm. brings so much to the table as a player, but mm-hmm. also this personality. Mm-hmm. Can I do that? Or right. young people that are coming in and saying, do I have to be like this mm-hmm. and stuff mm-hmm. like that? Is that the mold? Yeah, because yeah. because like you say, wait a minute, that's not me. I'm not I'm mm-hmm. not like Kenny. I'm not mm-hmm. or or younger players. I'm not like Rich. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know? Mm-hmm. So yeah. how do you do that? But right. the related Yeah. The similarities between what you're saying with Keltner yeah. and Arnoff is Sweet guys, right. positive vibe, right? 
they bring that to the table. Right. That's yeah. right. Yeah. yeah. And so, cool. yeah, that and and I, I felt fortunate because, like you say, I think a lot of young guys do uh, question that, or they don't know. They okay, well, Rich is kind of you know we're using Rich as the example, you know, but sure. Sure. Um, uh, you know you could say Mark. Um, um, Boys, uh, no, Mark. He's great, but uh, L.A. Um, Mark uh, Shulman yes, is, yeah. is, is, is has a lot in common with Rich. But again, that's just who he is. You know, it doesn't mean that's the only way to do this. Mm-hmm. And, and I felt fortunate to um, to kind of witness Arnoff related to Keltner early on in my day in my career and and see yeah. okay you can just be you and you know um and it can work uh yeah. but and so the other Keltner thing I really want to share because mm-hmm. it was another great learning moment yeah. uh was <clears throat> there so he's only there for a couple of days and so they're just cutting drums they're just getting his stuff uh and they've already laid s- scratch I forget if it was guitar or piano whatever you know um stuff that he's playing to and so they would, you know, kind of typical session, especially when you're just getting one player. You listen through the track in the control room. Uh, you know, everybody talks about it maybe a little bit, but you let him go try his first instincts. And, you know, so he runs the track once or twice or even just part of it or whatever, looking for a vibe. And it's Keltner, so it's total vibe. You know, he's probably – he's got jingle bells strapped to his leg and he's holding three shakers and whatever he's doing, you know. <laughs> and uh, and working some kind of magic. It sounds like overdubs are going on, but it's all him, you know. Right, right, right. And, uh, and – so after one or two passes, the producer or the engineer or the artist get on the talk pack. Well, what if you try such and such on the chorus? Okay, yeah, let me try that, you know, and then another pass. And then somebody else pipes up, what about in the bridge if you, you know, did blah, 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 whatever. And everybody's kind of giving their opinions. They've run it maybe five or six times now. And somebody says, come in and listen. Let's see where we are, you know. Yeah. He comes in the control room. We listen to whatever the most recent version is. And then I forget if it was the artist or producer. I forget who it was. But one of the authority figures in the room says, I think I know what it needs to be. I, I, I've, I've figured out now through this process we've done. And he explains whatever you know the approach should be mm-hmm. for the different parts of the song and when you use this shaker with this thing and when you left the backbeat out on every other time on the core whatever mm-hmm. you know and runs down what it ought to be as the fly on the wall i realize that's what Jim did first. I was going to say that. He already did it, man. It was his first instinct. It's the best thing. You've already heard him do it. It's already on tape because he's a badass. And he's <laughs> and this is his gig. This is what he does, you know. <laughs> and, but they don't realize that. And the, the brilliance and the super, like, taught me so much in this moment is that – He's there to serve them, and he's egoless. He doesn't say – because my instinct wouldn't be, I told you so. It would be, yeah, I tried that. As in, I relate, I understand, because that's what I thought it should be too. It's not even like, yeah, I already did that, man. But it's like, yeah, that's what I was thinking. But he doesn't even do that. He just says, that's a great idea. Wow. Uh-huh. And he goes out and he does it. And, uh, you know, and everybody's happy. Everybody's happy. And Jim doesn't care whether he gets credit for the idea. They're happy. They have what they want. It's musically good. If they realize it later or not, whatever. Doesn't matter. You know, he just says, that's a great idea. Let me go do that. And and he does it. And if I'm not there witnessing it, nobody knows. But, man, I was like, wow, that – that is for real right there, you know. I needed uh, that story. Yeah, I mean, about it's... 22 years ago. <laughs> I know, right? Oh, I can't tell you how many times before that I would have said, yeah, that's what I was thinking too. I did that uh, 20 minutes ago, you know. And, you're, and that's the nice way. It is. It is the nice... And that's genuinely... But he took it a step beyond that. A step beyond that. Like that I would have never even... Would never have occurred to me to, to, to handle it that way. But it was the... It was the best way to handle it, you know, because because even in trying to say, yes, I relate to you, you also could be saying, yeah, I already I know this, you know, I already, yeah, of course, I already did it. You heard me do it. You don't even realize it. That's why you think it's great. And you're like, you're not even saying that stuff, but you could be implying like, doesn't matter whose idea it is. It's the best idea. And you just told me to do it. That's what I'm going to do. And it's going to be awesome. You know, and that to me was like, Ooh, 
oh man, that's some serious shit right there, <laughs> you know. And I'm glad I even had the where the awareness to to take it for what it was at 24, you know. But but I, I witnessed it, and it, it. I learned a lot in that very moment, you know. So that couple few days of watching Jim between the juxtaposition of him versus Can how Arnoff worked, yeah. and that particular little nugget it was like, ooh man, this is. Uh, it was it all it taught me so much so i was living in san francisco was in this band the beggars uh relatively short lived um due to uh young guys not knowing what to do with their publishing money therefore getting themselves into trouble uh with drugs and whatever so the band breaks up um and uh, I had when I was in this band Vigilantes of Love out of Athens mm-hmm. we were a regional band touring around in a van and a trailer Better Than Ezra at that time was the same thing they were out of Baton Rouge and they were you know making a living playing clubs and whatever and so we ran across each other a few times and um, I always liked their band and, and they were always complimentary of my playing and we were friendly mm-hmm. but not like best buddies we didn't have each other's phone numbers this was pre-internet uh, we would run, you know, we'd go open for them in Baton Rouge where they had a crowd. They'd come up and play with us in Atlanta where we had a crowd, whatever. You know, we'd see each other twice a year or something. Mm-hmm. And um, and coincidentally, right around the same time that uh, my band, The Beggars, broke up, um, the original drummer from Better Than Ezra left the band. Yeah. And this was right at the same time that they were starting to have national success. Oh, wow. And so I got a call to... Um, to audition and it was they wanted a band member not a hired hand Mm -hmm. and so what they did was choose a couple of guys that they already knew that they thought could fit the bill and had us each in for a few days Mm -hmm. and so it was a during the day we'd play music at night it was a hang we'd go to dinner we'd go to see a band or whatever Mm -hmm. and each day like the first day we played stuff that I, they had sent me to learn. Second day, we worked up new material they'd never worked up before. So we're seeing how we work together as oh, yeah, individuals, yeah. I, creatively, idea-wise. Yeah. Third day, they brought in a little multi-track recorder and recorded so they could isolate the drums and stuff. I mean, it was very thorough. Pro- and then it's it's a it's a social thing in the evenings, you know. Right, right. And uh, so, um, anyways, the, cut to the chase. I got the gig, yeah. and so I. You know, I'm now joining what is still, I think, to this day, the biggest rock band to ever come out of New Orleans, which is my hometown. Nice. So I move home to New Orleans, wow. you know, and yeah. and that starts a 13 uh, year run of being in that band, yeah. you know. Yeah. And uh, so, you know, um, it was a that was a big turning point in life, you know, for me. I, I had been making a living. I'd, I'd signed. Three or four record deals, one of which was a major label deal, you know, mm-hmm. and I'm I'm eking out a living. I'm playing on records, you yeah. know, occasionally one of which would turn into kind of like Ezra's first record was. Uh, they recorded a few years before I was in the band, and then the, then Electra signed them and put it out just as it was. Mm-hmm. I had played on some stuff in in Georgia that then wound up being a major label record later, even though when I did it, it was for $50 and a pizza or whatever, you know. Oh, wow. And and so I was getting by, but this now all of a sudden I'm stepping up into playing on national television and, and in, in videos on MTV when they still played videos. And, you know, <laughs> right, like right. all of a sudden it's for, I'm on a tour bus, you know. Yeah. And so, awesome. yeah, yeah, it was, yeah. you know, that was, that was quite a uh, – you know, it was just sort of fulfillment of a of the the dream or the possibility. You know, uh, um, but even before I got there, the whole time my goal was just to make a living playing. Yeah, you know, yeah. and so I was already achieving that, and I felt thankful for that. But I also saw that I, I had goals beyond that. In that, you know, the older you get, the more you want some kind of security. You know, and yeah. and I, it was very much like a day to day kind of life I was living. I was making a living, not working another job. But then all of a sudden being a part of this, you could actually make plans like we'd plan out our touring year and we'd mm-hmm. know when we're going to make the next record and we'd mm-hmm. know what we're going to pay ourselves and, right, right. you know, all that kind of stuff. All of a sudden, you know, I'm able to think about buying a house and, you know, stuff like it, it was it was a, the next sort of step in life. And to hit that in my mid-20s was, you know, was it was just a, you know, that combination of, of 
of being as prepared as you can be, taking everything, every little gig and session you do seriously. Yeah. And also just like getting along with everybody, being nice to people, trying to leave a good impression, you know, yeah. uh, you know, that's, that's part of the equation. That's why those guys remembered me mm-hmm. and called me as a potential, you know, as a potential contender for the gig. It's why Christian Bush called me 10 years after we last mm-hmm. played music together mm-hmm. to come be a part of the Sugar Land thing, you know, like any gig you do, you never know where it's going to lead. But Mm -hmm. every gig you do, just do it the best you can do it Mm -hmm. because you don't know who either is playing on it or who's watching or hearing it that it could lead to the next thing. And pretty much all the work I've found has all stemmed from other work I was doing. You know, everything comes from, you know, it just all leads to the next thing, you know. Stories of success have that common narrative, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I feel. And, yeah. And the times that, and the number of interviews I've done, mm-hmm. it, that comes up time and time yeah. again. Yeah. You know, and sometimes it's immediate, or sometimes it's 10 years later, and other times it is immediate. Like, uh, yeah. of the most recent example for me, which was exciting for me, was uh, I felt very thankful. Uh, Jennifer Nettles actually just today put out a new single um, for a new album she has coming. Mm -hmm. And um, she asked me to play on that record, which I felt... Are you on that single? I am. Uh Uh-huh. Nice. Yeah. And uh, and so we went in... Well, she called me to ask, you know, to do it. And of course I wanted to do it. And, you know, we have a great friendship and relationship from working with her. And and Sugarland used me a lot in the studio. And so, you know, there's a... We have a something that works musically that that I appreciate and I guess she does as well and she wanted me on the record and but fortunately for me um, Dan Huffs was producing that record Mm -hmm. and I'd never worked with him before Mm -hmm. and so you know she had said you know some of the players like they discussed who the players would be and some were more his choice and some were more her choice and uh, and I fall, I fell in that category and and so that put me in that environment which was great had a great time making the record went well felt good awesome mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and um and Dan had said you know I'll be calling about some other stuff he was complimentary but in our business so often you say great gig to whoever just came off stage and eh you know like right, we're just right. we're just polite and which yeah. is a nice human thing to do so I don't know he's he's he was complimentary and kind, and I enjoyed working with him. And I see why he is where he is. He's great musically as a producer, but also great with people. Like the combination of all the things a producer has to do, he's he's knows how to do well. Um, Dan does a lot of volunteer work with my wife's organization. Oh, really? No kidding. Yeah, she oh, okay. works for an organization called Open Table Nashville. Oh, yeah, sure. Yeah, which is the charity that that uh, the Nashville Drummers Jam is going to be. Ah, uh, donating okay. a big portion cool. uh, to this. On year. the upcoming one. Okay. The upcoming yeah, yeah, one, yeah. which okay. I know you're on. I am. Yeah. Yes, yes. Um, the tribute to Alex Van Halen. Yes, indeed. Yeah, yeah looking there. forward so, to that. Yeah. Um, I had a little bit of a hand in trying to drop that into David's lap um, as far as getting. I was like, if you need a charity, I've got oh, one for you. Oh, right, right. Well, that's cool. So yeah, yeah. It worked out really well. Yeah. But I just wanted to uh, just say that. Um, my wife's just been doing this for a year, and she uh-huh. goes, "Do you know a Dan Huff?" I said, "Yeah, I know." <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like, He's a sweetheart. He, he is a sweetheart. He will cut people's hair. I mean, she works with <laughs> wow. homeless people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He will take time and uh, and help out. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, do laundry for people. I believe it, man. It um, doesn't surprise me at all. Just from working with him, you know, for the the whatever week and a half or so we cut that record yeah. i mean he's i really like him a lot respect yeah. him and the combination of who he is as a human yeah. and his musical um just ability and knowledge and all that yeah. it, that's why he's a great producer um i don't know why it surprised me the, but but i mm, think of, it's like i, I know you never know i know this guy and and really, he's and and that just adds so much to it. And you're just like, mm-hmm. wow, that's yeah. He's he's not just a nice guy, but you you he there's there's stuff going there's on. There's substance there. There's, there's substance there's, yeah, there. Yeah, yeah, there's yeah, real yeah. substance. Uh-huh. And, and she doesn't know who he is. Right. The people in no. her organization, they don't know who he he's is. He's just a dude who's helping out and doing yeah. a nice job. Yeah. yeah. But uh, so at the end of that that run of days of recording that, he said, I'll you know I'll call you for some other stuff and. The next day he called me. Oh. Yeah. yeah. And he said, Hey, it's Dan. And I hadn't gotten his number. I'm thinking, I'm rolling through my mental Rolodex of what 
what Dan? Yeah. yeah. And, and uh, so my instinct is, sorry? He said, Dan Huff. Oh, hey, Dan. <laughs> you know, <laughs> the last thing I expected. Yeah. And, then, and I had told him when we uh, were finishing up, I said, there's yeah, a few tracks we didn't do percussion on. I've got a studio at my place. I'm happy to cut. You send me two mixes and I'll do percussion, send it back if you want, whatever. So I thought maybe he's calling about that. And he says, what are you doing right now? Today, I said, well, i got a flight later this evening, um, but I'm free right now. He said, can you come to uh, Blackbird soon? Mm-hmm. Sure. And again, I'm thinking, okay, well, I'll go to Blackbird and cut some percussion. And he says, i got this Martina track that I want to uh, – <laughs> I'm like, what? wait, what? <laughs> you know? Yeah. And, and I mean, this is the next day, you know? Yeah, so yeah, – yeah. uh, but again, the point of the story is, A, they, that's maybe a little bit of the old humble brag. Yeah, I got to do that. Oh, Pretty awesome. Pretty, yeah. But But also the point is whether it's – uh, guys that I barely knew playing in two regional bands that then when they get a major label deal, call me a couple years later to audition or, uh, you know, that being better than Ezra or uh, Christian Bush. We play together in our early 20s and then he calls me when we're both 35, you know, mm-hmm. uh, or record with Dan Huff. And then the next day he calls about recording on another huge, great singer that That's he's producing, awesome. you know. So yeah. either way, just bring your bring your A game every time. You know, and yes, of course, you're working with Dan Huff. You, you know, you better do that. But when you're 22 and you're playing with a uh, your buddy who is no further along in the industry as you, still, you get along with each other well. You travel well. You bring all your good ideas to the table, or good and bad. You bring all your ideas to the table, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. but you don't have ego about them. You let the best musical ideas win. Like you just be a part of trying to make stuff good. Yeah. And yeah. and and it leads places. It's you know that's what that's what. You know, good work leads to more work, you know. Is there one compliment that you hear from people about your playing over and over again? Like, oh, I've, heard, mm. yeah, I've heard that again. I've heard that. Uh, I think the thing I, that people – well, the, there may be kind of two things that are that are very different things that, that I think both have their own value. One is usually if it's a – if it's a live situation or a, one of these step in with very little or no rehearsal kind of situations, I I'm I often am thanked for how much preparation I did, okay. like showing up and really knowing the stuff. Mm-hmm. So that's a unique thing. So that's a particular compliment. But in the I've done that scenario enough times. I mean, I did it a few times this year. I subbed for this pop band parachute. I did you know, mm-hmm. I um, you know whatever. It, it, it's it's showing up. Zero rehearsal, been given material to learn, and really know the stuff and play it like you've been on the gig. I just did it with Frankie Ballard, you know. It's, mm-hmm. And and so that's a thank you I get because apparently a lot of guys don't do it, mm-hmm. um, and I'm not sitting there reading charts. I might have cheat sheets, but I'm mm-hmm. I'm playing the stuff. I know where I'm going, and oh yeah, what's the bridge on this one? And I'll look over at my sheet, but I'm not I'm not looking at bars and and you know uh, I'm playing the stuff. I've really put in my homework. That's one thing. The other, the the thing that whether it's tracking a session thing or a live or just people I play with all the time or new people, mm-hmm. is just that it make it that it feels good. Like I feel like along with being musical and and knowing the music or coming up with ideas, such a big part of a drummer's job is not just keeping time; it's making it feel good. Mm-hmm. And I think I think the being from New Orleans and so much of that music as opposed to the other major influence for me which is great songwriting like coming up on the Beatles the other big part of my musical growing up was mm-hmm. New Orleans music which is not about songs at all really mm-hmm. it's about it's you know that meter stuff's just a bunch of riffs and or a chanting or mm-hmm. you know what I mean but it feels great you know and I'm yeah. using the meters but even the street the horn bands and the mm-hmm. you know the second, the, line. the second line stuff it's all about it shaking your ass all about it like just just having some particular way that the rhythm moves and this varies as far as how I apply it depending song to song artist to artist Mm -hmm. it could be super driving straight forward eighth notes like the first punk rock band I got to tour with or it could be super in between is that swung or straight not quite sure Mm -hmm. but it's Mm -hmm. but it's funky and it and it's consistent that's the thing like when you're in between stuff like that Whatever that lope is, it's just got to keep having that feel. Even when you play a feel, even when you go to the ride and it's the course, it's still that whatever that movement is, yeah. that's what groove is. And yeah. and so I think coming up in New Orleans where the rhythm 
is is what music is about more the mo that's the biggest most important part of the music in my mind in New Orleans music is the rhythm that's something that was really important to me and still related to like my love of the Beatles because Ringo plays with a lot of swing and a lot of kind yeah, of in between yeah. and so most of the music I loved growing up had just felt great you yeah, know and yeah. and so really getting inside the details of how to do that is mm-hmm. is has been important to me as a player. Mm-hmm. Like I didn't learn the rudiments. I didn't learn I couldn't play any marching stuff for you. Yeah. You know what I mean? But just my focus was in different places and 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 so much of it is about the detail of how to make uh the movement of music happen. Mm-hmm. And that can be informed from either what the songwriter or artist is bringing to the table and already establishing in their strumming pattern or something that they don't even realize, but you hear where their movement is Mm -hmm. and you accentuate that and Mm -hmm. and groove with it. Mm -hmm. Or it could be a track that's like nothing's established and you got to find what that is and you got to create what that is. But just being aware of all the possibilities and how to achieve them, Mm -hmm. like that's the thing that so much of my focus has been on and and that that's a thing I get complimented on a lot, which nice. which is I'm good with that because that's so such and you know I mean you focus on what you love and so that's important to me. So I've spent a lot of energy on that, and so thankfully that's what I get complimented for, and so that's satisfying. Are, are there? I know Modern Drummer used to do this. They mm-hmm. would talk about, hey, are there some records that are influential to you that you go back to? Because I, I always think about that. And I have mm-hmm. not yet ask that question uh, yeah, yeah, to yeah. anybody um, but I, I really love that because it's very telling mm-hmm, and, mm-hmm. and it also reminds me of the records that I keep going back to I mean there's some records that I've been listening to for 20 years mm-hmm, mm-hmm. that if I want to get ready for a session I'm putting this on mm-hmm. yeah. it's maybe not a particular drummer maybe it's just that record that artist or that particular have, record like, that Desert Island record, maybe two or three that um, say, you know, it's like, or maybe there's something new that you've been right, really right. digging into. Uh, let me think about that for a second. I mean, some of, some of the stuff that is just, um, that still I'll go back and refer to occasionally because even though I feel like I know it so well, I'll still be surprised when I haven't heard it in a while. And I'll yeah. remember, oh, this is why. It's kind of like yeah. your mom's recipe for whatever that's so great. You haven't had it in a while. You taste it again. Oh, I knew I love this. But when you actually experience it again, that's why I love it. Yeah. It's so yeah. good. Yeah. It's the same thing when I listen, if I go back and put on Beatles stuff or put on Zeppelin, mm-hmm. you know, or the meters. Like, really, those are touchstones for me that yeah. when I hear them again, I'm like, oh, so maybe yeah. Maybe not a particular uh, record. I mean, but not even necessarily, but, but just yeah. generally, those drummers. Yeah, sure. So what those drummers do feel-wise and musically is huge to me, you know. Um, uh, there are other drummers that were big influences to me, especially early on, but I don't necessarily refer to it uh, okay. back to it as often, like mm-hmm. a Stuart Copeland or a mm-hmm. Larry Mullen, or you know, they were they were instrumental in me becoming who I am because I emulated them so much at a certain point. Mm-hmm. But I don't necessarily refer back to them now so often, though I still find at moments things that I learned from them when I was 17 playing along with their record, I, they still come out like they're yeah. still there. Yeah. But I don't refer to them. As often as a current, you like bring the octobons to the dance. Uh, yeah, session. right, right. No, I didn't. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, other stuff. Um, there's a Neville Brothers record called Yellow Moon that is a particular favorite of mine. Um, but to me, that's even almost more about the production, which is Daniel Lanois, oh, uh, wow. you know, than it is about the – part of it's the playing, but part of it's just the record as a whole. You know, mm-hmm. same thing with the – he also produced uh, Emmy Lou Harris' uh, Wrecking Ball, which is yeah, another favorite record of mine. You yeah, know? Yeah, yeah, and yeah. so that's more almost about – musical vibe and and sure. rhythm is part sure. of that you know but sure. so this, sometimes that's more the kind of things that I constantly go back yeah. to you know or um, do you hear his band Black Dub yes oh god Brian Blade. I know. Oh, such a great geez, record. man. It's, it's really great. It's stuff. so good. Yeah, that's a go to for me. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, and, and I'm a, a fan of him as a player in general. Oh, uh, yeah, just wonderful. so good. So musical. And so it, his stuff feels so great. And, you know, he's a good reminder to me of like stuff can feel solid and and musical without I I have a bad habit of when I want stuff to be really solid I just I just play hard you know yeah, yeah, yeah and me too. Yeah. yeah and it doesn't always have to be that way yeah. you know and that's a good room he's a good reminder to me of that like I've yeah. I've watched him play from 10 feet away and 
he ain't beating the crap out of anything, but man, it feels good, yeah, you know. Yeah, yeah. And so, so that's great because I wanted to ask you uh, a, a little bit more about that. But I, you know, we're, we get into some really fine details because we're talking about Matt Chamberlain, and you're sure. like, it's like I feel like I'm a heavier hitter than him. But mm-hmm. he, and the, but then finding spaces to create that vibe, mm-hmm. and like how do you pay attention to the details? And mm-hmm. sometimes it has to do with maybe it's ha- it's a there's a dynamic element mm-hmm. to mm-hmm. it. Your internal dynamics as a player are so important, mm-hmm. you know. And and yeah, if you're playing too hard, your ghost notes aren't going to come through because your backbeat's so loud and where they set the levels, the, the little stuff's lost, you know. And so that's, that's interesting. All I've been that's, struggling with that this last couple weeks. Yeah, man. And that is it's up to you as a player to balance yourself and mix yourself. Like you should be able to put one mic up and, com- and compress it so you're getting some of the details, yeah. things that your ear would hear that, yeah. you know, so a little compression, but basically put a microphone up mm-hmm. and it sounds like you you, you can't say, oh, uh, turn the hi-hats down. No, play them lighter or choose different hi-hats that are a little darker. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, you know, oh, man, those crashes are crazy loud. Well, quit hitting them so hard, you know, and that's not always like – it's easy to say that, but in a live setting where you know everything's mic'd individually and the band just wants to rock, yeah, you kind of beat the crap out of the cymbals, you know, and, and yeah. that's okay. The, the guy out front's going to balance it. But really, when you're playing the instrument yeah. as it's meant to be played, especially for a recording when, in, in a studio, the, you should be playing it balanced. You should be mixing the kit as you play it, you mm-hmm. know, and, th- and that goes for within a given part of it, the snare drum, your backbeat versus your ghost notes mm-hmm. versus the some ghost or some little beats that are lighter than backbeat volume but louder than ghost, you know, like all that in between, that's all up mm-hmm. to you. And not only that within that drum, but then how loud is that drum compared to when you hit the toms like so often, I'll watch a guy playing and the snare, you know, he's playing a groove and it feels good. And then he goes and plays the toms and he's got them so muffled and he hits them kind of soft and the the kit just goes away in what's supposed to be an exciting moment, a fill, a lift. Mm -hmm. But instead it's like, and he's depending on the engineer to push those toms up. Well... You know, try and make that sound like it's supposed to sound right there in front of you. That's yeah. that should be your goal. Yeah. You know, you're not. Uh, yeah, to some degree, recording part of what's beautiful about it is is manipulating and sort of, uh, you know, turning things into something different than what they are in reality. Because that can be part of the creating of records. Sure, sure. But very generally speaking, as a drum kit player, you should be playing an instrument that feels balanced sonically. Well, know? take somebody like Daniel Lenoir, who produces these things and uses sonic tricks, maybe, to mm-hmm. create, to produce. Sure. Is using somebody that knows how to balance his kit. Well, Brian, that's right. Yes. And so maybe he's like, oh, I'm going to take a break. Yeah, and I'm yeah. Just have well, these- and that's the thing. Like, I think I think he's going to use tricks or, or so to speak, or use mm-hmm. the, play the studio as an sure. instrument right. for for musical betterment of what he's trying to achieve, you know, but not right. necessarily to fix something to that somebody's fix. not doing, I guess. you know. Yeah, so he's exactly. going to pick a player that's yeah. that's bringing something awesome already. Yeah. Yeah. And then he might augment that with other stuff, yeah. but he's, he, you know, he's trying to achieve a musical end, not trying to repair someone's deficiencies, you yeah. know. Yeah. So. I want to touch on, on, on one more thing because uh-huh. uh, in, in, Going down a list of, of drummers that are playing on this drummer jam coming up, oh, yeah. I came <clears throat> across your name, mm-hmm. uh, so which is great. I've I've known I've heard your name uh, mm-hmm. for a long time, uh, but it was like, oh, okay, I'm gonna for now, you know, leading up to this December 14th show, mm-hmm. I'm gonna push all these guys to the top oh, of the cool. list. Oh, cool, yeah, yeah. Uh-huh. You know, um, so I think you're probably one of the last guys. Uh, there's so many I've already interviewed before then, and I think there's some on, I'm some I'm going to be missing mm-hmm. coming mm-hmm. up. Yeah, but in an effort to uh, team up with David and mm-hmm. and Tom and and Chris and all those guys, yeah. uh, we're going to kind of have a, a bit of a presence there, and they're supporting cool. nice uh, what we're doing. And yeah, yeah, try and do the same thing. Yeah. Uh, so I just wanted to mention quickly, uh, December fourteenth is a tribute to Alex Van Halen. Mm-hmm. You're going to be at that show mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. performing as well. Yeah, yeah. And you've done some several of these drummer jams mm-hmm. before. Yeah. So. Have you done all of them? I haven't or? done all of them. Okay. Um, I, I was out of town for one or two of them. Uh, I didn't do Jeff Percaro or Neil Peart. 
But you did the Bonham one. I did the Bonham one. I did the, uh, I guess it was the first one, the uh, Jerry. Um, Jerry Gaskill. Yeah, they Gaskill. did two of them. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, I did one of those. Okay. Um, and I did Bonham and I did Stuart Copeland, yeah. which, who I was just a giant. I was such a police fan. Yeah, and yeah, so yeah. I'm still hoping. I know there were like all kinds of GoPros around the stage, but I have yet to see any video. Okay. I, I really want to see how what it turned out. What songs did you play? I did, um, I did uh, kind of a live segue they would do between. Uh, can't stand losing you and Regatta de Blanc, uh, so it was, which is an instrumental. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I think it's Regatta de Blanc. Yeah, oh, no. yeah, yeah. That's Regatta de Blanc is the instrumental, but yeah. they, but it, they would live. The police would do Can't Stand Losing You and segue into Regatta de Blanc, oh, and okay. then they would finish Can't Stand Losing You. And so I did that arrangement. Uh, and the other thing I did mm-hmm. was, and unfortunately, it was actually when I was recording the Jennifer record. So I was in the studio that day, so I couldn't do a sound check. I couldn't do, you know, mm-hmm. a, uh, but still, even with no sound check, I dared to. I brought my own little one microphone because I remember reading in Modern Drummer as a kid that Stuart ran his own delay stuff. Somebody told me that you did this. Yes, I right. Told you, I told him you were coming in. For an interview, and they said, "Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. Travis brought in a microphone. I brought a mic and a delay pedal, right? Yeah, and 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 we weren't playing to a click or anything. So I set the delay pedal at that moment in time with where we were yeah. starting the song, and uh, and I would turn it on and off, yeah, uh, myself. And it be- because, like I said, when I was sixteen or whatever, and I yeah. Copeland's my hero, and I'm reading, he's saying." Anybody could do it. I'm doing it myself. It's not my guy out front. I'm running these, except it was uh, Roland Space Echo tape delays at that mm-hmm. time. But he's he's controlling that. And so I thought, all right, if that's what he did, that's what I'm going to do. Oh and God. so I brought so it cool. in. And, yeah. And so mostly because of that element, it was such a like, let's see how this goes. I hope that guy's got it in front of the house. I hope I can hear it a little bit in the monitors to stay in time with the delay, whatever. Um, but it was it was the... I'm going to try and do what he did, you know, but with the same kind of how he approached things where I didn't learn it note for note. I like knew the song and the arrangement, but I'm just play what's in the moment and kind of mm-hmm. cop his vibe. And I played enough of his stuff when I was a teenager. I hope it came back well enough, but, but yeah. run those delay, turn it on and off at That's certain great. spots. That's and so I'm so anxious to hear how the, <laughs> how the delay thing worked yeah. out yeah. and I haven't gotten to see video yet, but, uh, but it was really fun to do, you know, remember what Bonham song you did? Uh, Bonham, I did, um, uh, what's it called? Um, the Wanton Song, yeah. um, uh, which is yeah. You, it, I never know any of their songs by title, but it, it, you would recognize if you heard it. But there's actually there is video of that up online. Okay, um, okay. And that was a no rehearsal. I think no yeah. sound check thing. That was yeah. a, like just you know, is what it is. Which everybody's kind of in the same boat on those things. I mean, actually, I think I. I think I got a rehearsal for the Copeland one, but didn't get a sound check. But all the other ones, I just stepped up, haven't oh, hadn't played the stuff with the guys at all before, and just do it. That's you amazing. Know. Yeah, I want to quickly, uh, real quick, just to ask about your um, your studio. Uh-huh. You've got it's, yeah, yeah. It's uh, Pro Tools rig. It's yeah. it's at my house, but it's in my. I live. I'm down in Franklin, and I'm kind of on a hill, so it's a. On one side of the house, it's the basement, but on the other side, it's yeah. it's awesome. It's all glass looking out. How it, long have you been doing that? Oh, man. Uh, I put it together. I had – we had a – Better Than Ezra had a studio in New Orleans where we would rehearse and record and had our office there and our uh-huh. merch came out. It was our little world headquarters, so to speak. Yes. And so um, – when a couple of us were moving uh, out of state, that we wound up becoming a co- commercial studio. But some of the gear that we all owned together, I wound up with, uh, and it was enough to where, with this plus some money, I can put together oh, my own great, deal. Great. And so, pretty much once I moved to town, within the within a year of when I moved to Franklin to Nashville, which was in early o- or late o nine, um, I, I got that together and yeah. have been doing tracks there since. Okay. Do you stay busy doing tracks? <laughs> There. You know, it varies. Uh, sometimes very busy and sometimes not much. Yeah. Um, and it, it's the kind of thing where occasionally I get the random email and, and it's somebody I've never worked with and they just want me on one track. But yeah. more often it's um, – I just have relationships with a handful of people that I've just known through my musical history somehow or another. Mm-hmm. That um, uh, Because with that kind of thing where you do in the tracks for somebody long distance um, – it's it works best when you have some kind of rapport or the more history you 
have doing it with each other, the the simpler it becomes because they kind of know what you are most likely to give them. You kind of know the sort of things they're looking for. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't have to be a constant back and forth. And even though you're in different places, you can achieve something. You know, It's harder when it – like the first time I do it with somebody new that I hadn't worked with before, Mm -hmm. it's a lot more interaction, a lot more trial and error. Um, But uh, so more of the work than not are people that I just work with regularly. And Mm -hmm. so when they're in the middle of a record or two, they're sending me stuff all the time. And then if they – if they're not producing something right now, then you know, then I'm, I might not hear from them. But then this other guy is keeping me busy, and sometimes it's a bunch at once, like uh, three different people I know are all making records right now. It's whoa, you know, trying to knock stuff out. Yeah. And other times it might be a few weeks, and I haven't done anything in there, yeah. you know. And so it's part of what I do, and I enjoy doing it, and it's a valuable tool. But it's. You know, it's it just varies. You, know? you could the time off. You could do like Matt does. Matt Chamberlain, put the funny hat on and re- go yeah. pro yourself. Right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. I know. I know. It's true. Um, <laughs> man, I feel like there's there's. I feel like we could go on. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I love the stories. I, I love um, the insight that you mm-hmm. have, man. And it's very telling uh, as to uh, why you've achieved success. Oh. Well. Uh, throughout the years well, thank and what's you. been going on so mm-hmm. it's really cool man it's been and it's a lot of uh, people that I've interviewed this year have been drummers that I've known that have done favors for me in coming here and helping us get this going uh-huh. so not knowing you yeah uh, I appreciate it man yeah Just man yeah the time and, uh, I mean yeah I, I thanks for asking me to do it oh, and yeah. uh, I know not all but most uh, or a lot of the guys that you've done so far and uh, and uh, you know I think it's cool thing you got going so happy to be a part of it you know cool yeah. well we're, we're there's some things that are uh, in the works right now that could uh, hopefully expand our listenership uh, quite a bit cool um, um uh, i'll uh maybe announce that as it as reveal it that as it reveal happens. that as okay. it happens okay. cool. uh, uh, but we're, we're real excited about uh, some of those things. But, cool. man, again, I, I really appreciate it. Yeah, it man. super awesome. Oh, absolutely. Man. Yeah, Thanks, it's Travis. great to meet you, and nice it's a pleasure, too. man. So there's the second half of my interview with Travis. Uh, I love the story with Jim Keltner. Uh, that's another one of those life stories that I wish I had uh, years ago. Man, it would have been would have been awesome. So uh, I, I hope that you guys uh, checked out both parts. If you're only checking this out, go to part one. It's just as interesting. Uh, Thanks to Mike Jackson again this week for helping me uh, put this together, make it sound good, make it look good. Uh, We've done some extra work on the YouTube videos for the Nashville Drummer Jam. Hey, what do you know? Uh, I just got a text from David Parks, um, and uh, he is one of the guys that's uh, involved in the uh, Nashville Drummer Jam. So he's just texted me. Uh, So there's a little reminder there. December 14th is the show at the Exit Inn in Nashville. Uh, Check that out. That is the um, tribute to Alex Van Halen. So again, thanks everyone for listening, and hope to see you around. Bye-bye.